Okay, so I want to begin today with first a heartfelt uh, thanks to the Honorable Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson for accepting our invitation. And we want to take this opportunity also to thank you for your years of generous service at the state level and at the federal level. We want to thank um, and let the staff, your staff, Representative Johnson and Representative Upton should be on here as well pretty soon. Here he is, here he is. Um, that your staff is not invisible to us. We want to thank them very much um, for um, helping us bring this uh, together and make this lecture happen. It's a great opportunity for our students. My name is Desmond Murray. I'm an associate professor of chemistry uh, here at Andrews University. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Barbara Harrison. Um, and she's the interim chair of our School of Nursing. And we wanted to make um, our distinguished speaker comfortable. So we have our School of Nursing um, as a co-host. And you'll see why when uh, we introduce her formally with the bio. So I just wanted to give a little bit of sense of a history of what's going on here. This uh, presentation this afternoon is part of our chemistry department, um, Dwayne L. Ford, the guest lecture series. And it happens to be the 56th year of our seminar program. So it has a long life. And in our 81 year history as a department. And over the years, our seminar program has intentionally planned to feature topics and speakers that are broadly relevant to and engages with the general public. And um, you know, through chemistry and science related subjects. So we've had lectures and topics and lecturers on COVID-19, Ebola, the Gulf oil spill, gold mining in Colorado, CBD, and many, many others that we think has an underlying science and chemistry foundation, but has relevance to the general public. So the request today to have uh, Chairman Johnson speak with us was born out of that tradition. But I also wanted to start engaging the chairwoman and her staff on a policy level um, about the idea of the power and the promise of early research as a strategy for improving American science education for the 21st century and beyond. So this is part of my thought pattern and thought and reasoning for us being here today. So I would first like to now like to introduce the next two speakers. First is our provost who will welcome all of our guests and then Rep representative Upton who will uh, welcome Chairman Johnson to um, this, this uh, event. So, our provost, Christian Arthur, um, began his uh, service here as provost back in 2016. He has a bachelor's degree in theology from the University of the Southern Caribbean. That's in Trinidad and Tobago. He's a graduate also um, of Andrews University in curriculum and instruction and educational administration and completed postgraduate studies at Harvard's Institute for Management and Leadership in Education. Congressman Upton um, is our representative here in the Southwest, um, Southwest Michigan, sixth congressional district. Uh, he serves as a vice chair of the House Problem Solvers Caucus. He is the top Republican on the energy sub uh, committee. And one of the interesting things that ties into our science theme here is that he helped launch back in 2014, helped launch the 21st Century Cures Initiative. And I believe that the Cures 2 legislation is um, in the works. 
And that initiative brings together researchers, industry, patients um, to speed up the discovery, development, and delivery of life-saving um, of life-saving cures. He has been here with us um, as an elected official since 1986. So those are our next two speakers. Uh, Provost Arthur, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murray. And it's my, my pleasure to, to welcome all of our students and employees, uh, all of our friends of Andrews who are part of this lecture this afternoon. And a very welcome, very distinguished welcome, if you will, to our own. And we're going to claim him, his father's <laughs> part of our state, uh, Congressman Upton. He, he's a friend of Andrews. And if I may be so bold as to say, he's a son of Andrews, uh, because <laughs> we, we claim him as our own as well. Um, so, Congressman, if, if you didn't know that before, you are an Andrew's son, and, and we're very <laughs> glad that you're part of us this afternoon. And, and your friend and colleague and, and fellow Congressperson, uh, Congresswoman Johnson, it's good to have you here at Andrews. Andrews is a very diverse university. We have students from all 50 states. 20% of our students are from international countries. Uh, we, we take great pride in, in our diversity. Um, and, and anyone, I challenge any student, if they walk across the campus and they begin to have conversations, they will find someone from their part of the world. Congresswoman, if you begin to have conversation with us this evening, you will find someone at Andrews from your part of the world. That's who we are. So it's good to have you here. Welcome to all of our participants. Welcome to our students and to our, to our honored guests this evening, our Congress people. Welcome to Andrews University. Glad to have you here. So Congressman Upton, it's your turn. Well, thank you. It is, it is a delight to, to welcome a, a friend, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Uh, because of COVID, we don't see as, each other as much as, as we used to. But let me just say a couple things about her. And I'm outside in Kalamazoo. I'm not too far away. Uh, but I've been honored to get uh, an honorary degree from Andrews. So did my, my dad. And I have been on campus so many times. The president, the, 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 the staff, the faculty, the students, really outstanding. Eddie, this is known as the most diverse community uh, a college in the country. Uh, and I know that they're gonna have great questions. They're, they're waiting on pins and needles. Unfortunately for me, I'm in Kalamazoo and there's no broadband in this building. I'm in this brand new building. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, Southwest Michigan First. and we, We've got a board meeting that's going on now. So the broadband doesn't work. So I stepped outside and it's raining. <laughs> so I'm gonna be short in my remarks, but I'm, I'm glad that you're with us. And let me just say this, as we get through COVID, uh, Eddie not only uh, has an extreme and important position as a committee chair uh, of the science committee, so important. She also chairs, of course, the Congressional Black Caucus, a, a wonderful organization uh, that is so powerful in so many different ways. I have so many friends on that caucus. Uh, I look at Bobby Rush, who's my chairman of my energy subcommittee that I'm the top Republican on. He and I have been great partners. He has a district not too far from and a house not too far from Andrews University. I've been to his district uh, a lot over the years. We, we've helped each other. He's a good friend. He's on my hallway, just like Eddie's in my building. We used to go up and, and down because our parking places were next to each other practically in, in the Rayburn building. But let me say this about uh, Eddie. Not only is she the dean of the Texas delegation, as I am the dean of the Michigan delegation, uh, she's a nurse. She cares a lot about health care. And as I push forward on 21st century cures with Diana DeGette, it was a, a very significant piece of legislation uh, when I chaired the Energy and Commerce Committee, speeding up the, the approval of drugs and devices. It also included $45 billion more in health research. So important as we look for cures for all these diseases. It's already been identified. Our bill, our new law, which Obama signed into law, last bill that he signed into law, is already responsible for finding a cure for things like cystic fibrosis, 
for sickle cell, major advances in, in cancer research. And in fact, Diana get my partner, a Democrat from Denver, and myself are in fact going to be introducing the next version of this next week. We're working very closely with President Biden on a whole number of different initiatives. But as I think about Eddie and her state and the wonderful things that Texas does, MD Anderson is an incredible institution you know, where they literally get nearly 50% of the NIH research dollars and the advances, the cures that we're going to be finding large, sorry about this train in the background. I'll be, I'll be quick. She's a lead co-sponsor of the, of the RISE Act, uh, which is going to help universities, particularly that had to shut down uh, their science departments because of COVID. <laughs> they know we're here. They know we're here. Um, she's she's been a big help on that research uh she's she's a friend she's gonna do a great job but i think before i get too wet here in the rain and, and you guys get trounced out by this uh amtrak train which i do support uh i'll turn over uh i'll yield the the, the rest of my uh time to my friend eddie bernice johnson uh, i'm just sorry we can't the three of us we can't all be there in person today so god bless and eddie i'll see you next week when we're back into session Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Congressman Upton. Thank you so very much. So now we'll have uh, Barbara. All right, thank you so much. I, I have to say, uh, Chairman uh, Johnson, as I take a look at uh, all the accomplishments that you've had over your career, it is so exciting and it is such, such a fresh reminder of the privilege it is to be in academia supporting our nurses who are coming up uh, in the profession. Um, just the impact that you have made on healthcare um, immediately and peripherally through your through your role right now is really remarkable. And so at this time, I now have the pleasure, pleasure of introducing Jaylene Kuhn. Uh, Jaylene is a junior nursing student here at Andrews University, and she is on her path to leadership already because she is our junior class officer. Thank you so much. My name is Jalen Kuhn, and I have the honor today of introducing our speaker. Our speaker today is Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. She is serving her 15th term representing the 30th Congressional District of Texas. She is the first African American and the first woman to chair the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. She's also the Dean of the Texas Congressional Delegation, as well as the Dean of the Texas New Mexico and Arizona Democratic Congressional Delegation. Chairwoman Johnson is the highest ranking Texan on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the first nurse to be elected to US Congress. Chairwoman Johnson has a reputation as a stateswoman who works with both parties to get things done, a reputation earned during her more than 40 years in public office. She's widely recognized as one of the most effective legislators in Congress and she has a long-standing reputation for providing excellent services to the people who elected her. During the 107th Congress, Chairwoman Johnson had the honor to serve as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and her acclaimed initiative, A World of Women for World Peace has gained both national and international recognition. Last but definitely not least, Chairwoman Johnson is the proud mother of her son, Kirk, and of her three grandsons, Kirk Jr., David, and James. We are so honored to have, your, to have her here with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. I decided I better write some notes so that I wouldn't talk too long, but I wanna thank my colleague, uh, Congressman Upton, who has been a, a really respected leader uh, in the Congress, and I've enjoyed working with him. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, it made me think about my student days. I did attend um, college not too far from Michigan. It's right on the South Bend of Lake Michigan at uh, St. Mary's College at the University of Notre Dame for my undergraduate studies. And I know how stringent the studies are right now, Ms. Uh, Kuhn, so I wish you the best of luck for your future nursing career. It is a pleasure to be joining you virtually as, as was mentioned by my colleague, 
we don't get to see each other very much, which interferes often with our relationships, but at least we can use Zoom. Andrews University is among the top small colleges in STEM, which I have had as a, an interest all of my political career. Uh, I guess because I'm really from Dallas where Texas Instrument developed that first chip. I began to understand how important STEM education would be for our future. So I'm very pleased to be speaking with many of you today. Undergraduate studies are a critical time to explore your academic passions and hone your skills. And I know that um, at different points in your careers, you will be proud of yourself and then concerned about yourself. But let me assure you, the important thing is focus on your goals. And I'm delighted that all of you wanted to participate in this uh, conversation. I'm delighted to discuss with you for the future of our nation's scientific enterprise and the critical role uh, that science plays in policy making. I often refer to this committee as a committee of the future because building a bright future for all requires that we lead with science and pursue scientific solutions uh, for our challenges we face today, and they are many. It is vital to the future that our nation and scientists, engineers have all have a seat at the table through our policy decision making process. It is critical that decision makers be informed by the best available science as we work back and forth for good policy. Now it is clear that we are supposed, and I hope we are, the most diverse minds with a focus on pure science. So we try not to be partisan. We have an opportunity to look beyond politics uh, and we and the future prosperity depends greatly on what we do now to nurture students like you, the STEM talent of our country around the world. And we must continue to attract great talent, whether it's in our country or others. It is necessary for us to keep pace with competitors and deliver the benefits for all Americans. And as I've said many times, uh, to ensure scientific advances, address the challenges America faces, it is critical that we work to ensure that STEM professionals represent the rich diversity of our nation. I want to compliment you for the diversity on this campus and ones that stands out for the nation. Building STEM opportunities for all has been a main priority of mine throughout my time in Congress. As the first African-American and the first female to chair this committee, I understand the progress that can be made when we work together to open doors and opportunities for others. The shifts in work and life during COVID-19 pandemic brought on a year of uncertainty. As a committee, we needed to adapt how we operate to keep our members and staff safe. We've held hearings and markups virtually, which has been a significant change for members of Congress and staff. It's so much better when we can associate with each other personally. We have devoted a number of briefings and hearings uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic from the pandemic's impact on university research and R&D to support the healthy travel. It's been endless what we've had to consider. These unprecedented times have been hard on everyone. And we have an obligation to continue to work for the people and I'm proud of what we've accomplished so far. Too many young individuals, especially women in minority communities were faced with tough decisions uh, about education and their careers. But thanks to our research and development enterprise, vaccines and working with scientists across the globe, we are recovering. We must also ensure our nation's early career researchers are not left behind. To address this, my friend and colleague, ranking member Frank Lucas and I introduced the Supporting Early Career Researchers Act at the very beginning of this 117th Congress. Uh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and that passed in March. Uh, we have to act now to avoid losing an entire generation of talented scientists and engineers from our research pipeline. And, and that's you and the fellow classmates here at this outstanding university. We are the very people whom you will need to overcome the next health crisis, combat climate change, continue our exploration and discovery and devils in space, and also strengthen our infrastructure. It has been a highlight of my career to advance legislation that would help strengthen our nation's research and development enterprise. To build that bright future, we must ensure that the United States continues to lead in science and technology and that the benefits of our advancements are shared by all Americans, no matter their background. This leadership is essential uh, to our economic and national security. Congress and policymakers are not the only institutions or individuals shaping our future. We rely on our federal agencies, our research institutions to achieve these goals. Whether that be solving the crisis, uh, climate crisis, stopping the spread of misinformation or ensuring equality in emerging technologies. Our agency, one, our agency, the committee is one. Uh, I chair with the jurisdiction of the National Science Foundation. I want to directly address the role of NSF plays in bridging the gap between research, innovation, and public understanding. NSF has long supported both youth-inspired research and efforts to translate research into practice. It is this context that as chairwoman of this Committee of Science, Space, and Technology, I'm moving toward a comprehensive reauthorization of the NSF. A reauthorization bill ensures an agency continues to operate and pulls forth priorities of the agency. This bill, called the NSF of the Future Act, will move towards the future where more researchers, scientists across the fields and disciplines can produce, pursue their best ideals. Who knows, maybe one day you could be working at NSF or conducting research funding by NSF or even leading NSF. The answers today really will be, will be followed by pressing problems that are more complex than devising a single scientific solution. As students, you often work in groups and understand that working with your classmates from different disciplines can spark new lines of inquiry. I'm dedicated to reaching across the aisle and working with my Republican colleagues to find bipartisan solutions. Over the last few months, my colleagues and I on the Science Committee have put forth a collection of bipartisan innovation-related bills. These bipartisan bills are the first step in a large push for this committee to ensure that the United States can tackle our most pressing concerns we face as a nation, like climate change, public health, and ensuring a strong economy. These policy objectives are much like the work you do as students. They are bold proposals with big ideas. And the committee, just as scientists are, when conducting quality research has been tried and has been tried to be thoughtful and transparent through the entire process to deliver this transformative legislation. Your time as undergraduates is a special time. Throughout four, your years at Andrews University, you all have the opportunity to be a part of a community that can drive change. You are, your learning skills and gaining tools necessary to find these scientific solutions that I mentioned earlier. And I hope that you take the experience you gain at this university and do great things for it in the future. I wish all of you the best 
And I hope you'll continue your studies for whatever comes next. You have put in a lot of hard work to get to this point. And if you continue working and putting forth your effort, you can contribute to good policy and action for the future. I will now be available for questions. Okay, thank you so very much. Um, my co-host, Barbara, are you unmuted? I am now. Yes, yet. you could go ahead and lead this portion. All right, so thank you so much, Chairwoman Johnson. That is absolutely inspiring to see the vision, the bigger vision that you have and how you've been leading this committee. I am um, at this time, if there are you know, questions from our chemistry students or from our nursing students. Um, I think we'd like to answer their questions first. We don't have too much time. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, place your questions uh, at this time in the chat. And while, while they are placing their questions, uh, Ch Chairman um, Johnson, that transition for you from healthcare, from nursing to politics, what was that like? Well, it was very interesting. I was very active uh, civically in the community and I was drafted uh, to run for office. It came as a surprise. I never dreamed of being okay. in elected office. And that was back in 1972 when I ran for the Texas House of Representatives. Okay, very good. So um, any any questions yet? No, I don't see any yet, but uh, okay. Chairman Johnson, I have a question that I would uh, love to ask you. So for our uh, young and emerging nurses, um, from what you've seen as, as to how the process works, how does one get an opportunity like that if they're not drafted? What would you recommend for our young nurses who are looking to make a difference and be a part of a solution on a much bigger scale? Well, let me say that I would not wait to be drafted. Uh, <laughs> if they have a real burning desire to be a part of that type of policy making, make yourself known to the people and start getting out and, and uh, gaining support and running for office. I encourage that. When I first went in, there was so few, just almost no nurses. But since that time, there have been other nurses that have joined it. We need the impact of all of our young people, but we especially need the impact of nurses because you are the first person next to that patient. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling so alone when we started drafting the first uh, healthcare bill. We didn't have much expertise inside the Congress. And I was put on a special committee to help to draft that legislation because I had been a bedside nurse mm -hmm. and had worked towards with people and understood some of the human factors that had to be considered as we drafted that kind of legislation. So we really still need that kind of input. Let me just say that we have over the years a large number uh, I've seen a great change. At first, it was all lawyers. And can you just imagine a lawyer trying to <laughs> visualize what it's like to be a bedside nurse? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so it's important to have as broad a coalition of professions and experiences to go into making that legislation uh, as you can. And we're leading in that direction. We have much more diversity than we had when I first went in not only from nurses, but we have now some physicians, uh, we have labor workers, we have a wide correlation, which is all important to give that real experience of which we're trying to address by writing legislation and never had any experience in those areas. So I know from reading your committees, I, I subscribe now to your committee's newsletter so I know that there was, is concern about the status of STEM education in, in the US. What, what uh, thoughts do you uh, wanna share with us on that? 
we continue to have a shortage of young people who are interested in our STEM courses, and especially in with minorities, and especially uh, uh, with with uh, women. Mm -hmm. And so we have tried very, very hard to get the information around the country. I belong to a national organization, and about 15 years ago, I asked them to take it on as a volunteer, a program to encourage, especially minority women to go into STEM fields. And I'm happy to say that the Lynch Incorporated has done that and many others. The, uh, uh, there are engineer groups who are trying to get more attention and Girl Scouts, all of those groups that I work with, but we still do not have enough. We have got to encourage our young people to remember that to play music and to play football is great. But when they finish with a lot of that, their life is just beginning. Yes. So we do, we have now astronauts that are now physicians. And uh, so we, we've got to mix this and let them understand we cannot forsake our scientific endeavors. That's what keeps up competitive in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if we didn't have access to research around the world, just think we had an American woman that came up one of the vaccines that, for COVID-19. Not many people have heard about that, but we have. And what we need to do is make sure that women and minorities are interested beyond just engineering, but certainly engineering. Uh, to keep us moving forward as leaders in the scientific endeavors. We are up against a lot of competition and our international um, openness for the research has kind of slacked off some. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been accused of brain draining India uh, and some other countries. We've got to produce our own. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm so happy to see that you have leadership that started in the islands mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that understands just how important uh, these endeavors are. This leads the world. Mm -hmm. We were stimulated to get into space by Russia being ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And we had to catch up and we're trying to stay up and stay as leaders. It is important for many different reasons, uh, for security and everything else that we stay ahead of uh, I'll be a part of the first in the world mm -hmm. uh, with our scientific endeavors. It's extraordinarily important. So in, in, in that context, could you say a little bit more about the Early Research Act or bill that you said, you mentioned um, for early researchers? I, I believe you said you're creating a bill or working on a bill. We are trying to, we're trying to make sure that every endeavor has special outreach for women and minorities mm -hmm. to make sure that they feel comfortable and they're safe. We've done a lot of research uh, in why we don't have as many minorities uh, and women going into these fields. And there was some justification uh, and are still some lingering, but we are trying to call attention to these deficits among our institutions so that they can help fill this gap. It, uh, you don't have to look very far to see that in the past, we had more minorities going into entertainment uh, yeah. of all sorts mm. prior to us trying to emphasize going into chemistry mm -hmm. and nursing and medicine uh, and engineering, because those are the areas that will guide us into our future. Mm -hmm. Very good. Barbara, you have... Uh... All right, I saw a hand up from one of our students, uh, Zoe Gentil, and I don't see her at this time. I'm here, sorry. Are you? Okay, so Zoe, go ahead. Hi, um, I had a question about um, if there are any bills or initiatives that are currently in Congress or trying to be passed about um, STEM, um, STEM education specifically for people of color or people in underrepresented, um, underrepresented communities? Oh, indeed. We, every session I've been there, we've had legislation addressing 
this issue. What we're trying to do now is get our minority serving institutions brought into the major research uh, linkages. And um, we, have, we have legislation that tries to equalize the opportunities there and bring up our labs and research strength within our um, minority serving institutions, as well as making sure that in our uh, review uh, that's available through the National Science Foundation, try to use a little affirmative action to make sure that the opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've had to look at that very closely because in the past, many of our minority serving institutions could not compete with the Harvards and the Princetons and the Stanfords uh, for the peer review. And so we've tried to make that such that they can be looked at and be given support like many of the other research institutions. So I've just put up in the chat for everyone, the link to Chairman uh, Johnson's committee. So you can go there and see some of the many issues that she deals with, she and her committee deals with. And also, like I, I do now, um, you can subscribe to their newsletter to get updates on what's going on in that, uh, in that area. Any, any other? Yeah, Dr. Murray, I have time for one more question. Yes, go ahead. Chairwoman Johnson, we're okay with. All right, I have a question from Gabriella Francisco and her question is, what are the best ways for entry level chemists to get involved with government related jobs? That's endless. We have all kinds of labs that spread it around the country. Uh, their National Science Foundation has many studies of which they will fund. Uh, but, you know, maybe I'm not, um, I'm really not trying to do a downer uh, in terms of how can we. Uh, that is not an unusual question. And I want you to know that you can access many linkages, look at uh, our research labs, mm -hmm. look at the federal government in general, uh, agencies. Uh, we directly relate to the Department of Energy. Yeah. Uh, and then we, uh, the weather is also a very important thing. We're dealing with more disruptive weather conditions mm -hmm. and they have a shortage mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, of people. Uh, so I think that you can really uh, connect yourself with a lot of opportunities by looking through all that the federal government has to offer. And I'm sure there are other universities and state institutions as well. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. So Chairman Johnson, I know we've probably already gone through five minutes of questioning, which was <laughs> what we agreed on, but are you okay with one more question. Are you okay now? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. All right. So anybody has one last question and then we'll do a wrap. I do have a quick, quick question. Okay. Um, I am currently a student and I'll be graduating. So I'm coming out into the field of nursing and you mentioned it was really important to get into leadership and do those things as soon as possible, as well as encouraging minorities in these fields. What do you think is something I can do right now while I'm not in politics to help with that? Well, I don't know what, what job you will select, but whatever you do in nursing is going to be important. Uh, there's a big shortage, and we're certainly mm -hmm. challenged during this virus. Mm -hmm. uh, they are looking uh, for nurses all over. Yeah. And nursing is a very diverse profession. You can pick almost any area from industry to position offices, to institutions, uh, even military. There are opportunities in practically every profession for someone who has the preparation of a nurse. Okay. Thank you. It's endless. <laughs> it's endless, that's correct. And, and there is a deficiency. People are leaving the field now for multiple reasons due to this uh, pandemic. Yes. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've thank enjoyed you. visiting with you, and I'm delighted to know about your, the outstanding university. 
I have to admit that I had not heard about the university, but I have worked with the, your congressional representative who is an outstanding leader. Yes. So yeah, we will definitely keep in touch and um, wish you all the best in your endeavors as you try to make a continue to make a difference in your state and in our country. Thank you so much for being a role model for all these years. Well, thank you very much. And let me encourage those students, you are getting the best education in the nation. Make it pay off for you. Reach out for great uh, reasons to be involved in whatever you like and be dedicated yourself the most. The opportunities really are there. Yes. Thank you. That's a great way to close. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.